G'day trendsetters, welcome to the inaugural Funk Wabi podcast. It's a podcast on Chanayu, or the Japanese tea ceremony, and where it's going in terms of fashion, self-development, and contemporary art. So, uh, polish the floor, get a tea, and tune in. Today, for the first episode, I'd like to talk about the future of fashion, and you might think that it has nothing to do with the future of Chanayu, or Chanayu in itself. But the idea comes from the visionary Virgil Abloh, who I have a deep respect for. He was a fashion designer, designer, architect, DJ, general cultural visionary, who sadly passed away at a young age in 2021. He's around 40-odd, maybe 41-ish. I think he was born in the same year as me. So anyway, 41, I think. Before he passed away, he left a lot of content in terms of lectures and calls, mentoring calls with students, where he would um, mentor the students in their, um, in their education as budding fashion designers or designers or architects. And a lot of that remains online, which is part of his philosophy of sharing ideas. And in one of his mentoring calls with the LVMH or Louis Vuitton prize winners, uh, he was asked a question by one of the graduates, which goes like this. After all the revolutionary moves that you have done already, where do you see fashion going next? And the first thing that Virtual responded with was, I'm as much a fashion historian too. Um, so I thought it was quite interesting to see his mind immediately jump to history. One of the things that my grandmaster uh, of tea said to me when I started to wrestle with where tea was going in a contemporary or modern context outside of Japan is he said, uh, <laughs> So that means that after you've studied the old or the founding manuscripts of tea, so you've looked at the legacy of our early tea masters and studied them and understood them, then you gain confidence to go off and do something new. Um, now, of course, I speak Japanese. Um, I love studying and I, um, and I am very much prepared to devote myself to going in deep into these things. And uh, after around, I'd say, when did I start? Around 2011, so what, it's now 12 years later? Finally, I've got the confidence to be here speaking to you today. <laughs> Um, of course, not everyone will have the time to do that. And in Western culture, rather than go in deep and master something first before you find your own self-expression, which is uh, very usual in Japanese culture, uh, in Western culture, people would uh, probably prefer to start experimenting with new ideas uh, pretty much from the get-go. So that's a huge cultural difference that I have to bridge in my teaching, but that's probably a subject of another podcast. Anyway, um, one of the things we can think about in terms of history of tea, so tea was first foreign to Japan. The tea, tea, the plant, and tea culture itself was imported from the Asian continent or China. Um, so like Tang Dynasty, Song Dynasty, China, the tea culture from there was imported into Japan, then remixed and became something that we know as Chanyu or the Japanese tea ceremony today. One example is torture. It's known, uh, written a, a tea battle. And in China, it took on the form uh, of you have two tea masters that would prepare tea uh, with their own, you know, special water, their own special tea, um, prepare it, and a jury would judge who had the best tea. But in Japan, this took on the form of people gathered in a room, and there would be uh, different types of tea prepared, and people had to guess as to the origin of these teas. And the person who had the, had the, the most correct uh, guesses would win prizes and things like that. So the, already you see that form in China um, was a great thing for that time. But then by the time that it got to Japan and with the culture and the local culture there, it sort of morphed a bit into something a little bit different, but still under the same name, torture. And that was kind of a bridge between uh, the early forms of monastic tea and Zen monasteries uh, to something that kind of became a bit debaucherous after a while, the torture gatherings. Uh, the tor torture, I have to be careful, it sounds like torture. Uh, the torture gatherings. And then um, after having sort of that, that um, more, uh, more social aspect on top of the 
the rigid uh, Zen etiquette and stillness, that sort of morphed into Chana Yu. So now we have Chana Yu, which came into its own in Japan. Um, it has different canons of thought inside it, like Wadi. Uh, and now it's all over the world in different countries. So just like torture, in uh, from going from Song Dynasty China to Japan, then morphing and then gradually becoming Chana Yu, uh, China Yu now, outside of Japan, what form is that going to take in the future? Um, it's an open question. One of the things, just on the point of history, um, it's really important, especially in the Japanese tea world, um, that you need to look at different sources for your history. If you just go to your own tea school for your historical context, it's going to be biased AF. So make sure that you look at the history from the point of view of different tea schools and also the history of tea in Asia from the perspective of China and also Korea, not only Japan, because um, the way that history is done is not necessarily uh, faithful to historical facts. You really need to get a broad view from different cultures and different tea schools as to what was the real deal. And I urge people to do that. So after Virgil talks about being a fashion historian, the second thing he says is something intensely interesting, which is he talks about canons in fashion. This is C-A-N-O-N, -N, not C-A-N-N-O-N. -N. So a canon is like um, the, a foundational uh, philosophy that has a lasting influence on a particular art. So if we think of the recent history of fashion in the Western world, have figures, we have figures like Martin Margiela, who came from Belgium and established his own label in Paris and made a huge and enduring impact on not only the fashion world but also the Western art world. And the canon that he left behind, you could say, if we wanted to put it into one word, uh, a deconstructivist canon or deconstruction. So what does deconstruction mean? It means taking things apart. So in the fashion world we have garments, clothes, you take the clothes apart and put them back together in new and interesting ways that are not n not necessarily faithful to convention. So you're trying to see what makes the clothes tick, so to speak, and how they work and show the workings on the outside. So he'd done things like um, putting the lining of garments on the outside to become a feature on the outside of a garment, not something that necessarily sits against the body making the garment comfortable also revealing the stitching, so we get to see how something is put together and how things work, um, which gives us uh, um, some, some sort of inspiration to go and see how other things work in our environment and really start to know our surrounds and getting deeper and feel our existential reality by this inspiration of what we see in the garments and the art in front of us. And in doing this, of course, he's cha challenging beauty ideals that have been established and in place for a long time. So by showing the workings and, and the blood and guts of stuff, um, does, does that still mean that this is beautiful or is it stylish or philosophically interesting? Like what's going on? Um, he's raising questions and breaking things apart in order that we might understand what we've been doing and understand where our assumptions have been coming from. Really opening ourselves up to have, um, inviting us into uh, into a world of introspection. Now, <clears throat> um, this is highly relevant because in the world of Chana Yu, things like this were happening about 400 years ago. So the first example I can give, which is not a very common example, is one of tea master Fruta Oribe, who, along with Martin Margiela, happens to be um, one of my biggest idols of all time. Um, he was kind of like the Margiela of his time, but in the tea world, and he lived in the 16th century and died in the early 17th century. Uh, so uh, what Oribe did is taking or riffing on the example or the canon left behind by his teacher, Senrikyu, he started to have a kind of dis deconstructivist angle towards his tea practice. And what did that, what did that mean for him? Well, he uh, took things like the the structure of a tea house, um, which by his day had shrunk down to around two mats and included an alcove at the top of the room, just near the head guest, who was usually the most important person there. 
And what he did is he took the alcove and he chucked it down the back of the room. And so totally reversing the room and the orientation that people were used to. So when they go in the tea house, they didn't know where to sit, didn't know what to do, didn't know, didn't know how to operate all of a sudden in an environment that was usually quite familiar to them. Another thing he did, uh, which is, links back to what Margiela did with taking clothes apart and putting them back together again, is he'd take objects that were usually doomed, like a great example is the Yabari Bukuro Mizusashi, which um, had exploded in the kiln and was had massive cracks and totally in, in, uh, beyond repair, and would usually be chucked on the ceramic heap and ground down into grog. And anyway, um, he saw it and thought, oh my God, this form is unbelievable. We have to save this thing, mend it, and make it hold water again so that we can use it in the tea room. And so he repaired it with um, a huge amount of lacquer and then used it, cracks and warts and all, um, in his tea practice. And another thing, you take... Uh, Rikyu's forms of a, of a Raku Chawan, so he had both red and black Raku forms. They were very subdued and quiet and still. And he, uh, Oribe started to warp them and go to where potters were making their pots. And while they were still formed freshly uh, s symmetrical on, on the clay hump, he would like pull them and warp them. Uh, so these distorted forms become the final, uh, the final product or the final artwork. And he'd use these almost unusable forms in the tea room. And some other examples that link directly to Margiela's practice uh, are things like uh, taking apart chawan, so cracking tea bowls in four, shaving them down, making them smaller, and then putting them back together again with kinsigi or gold repair uh, and seeing how that is going to work. And then uh, he had some priceless calligraphy from ancient Z masters from China. It was too big to fit in the alcove. So he cut it in half, put it on uh, two individual scrolls, which was like made people lose their minds, and hung them in the alcove, things like that reflects uh, Margiela's deconstructivist practice in the fashion world in the 1990s and early 2000s. Um, also, we could take a Rikyu, a classic example of his mitate practice, which is uh, reimagining things. So you take everyday objects that not, are not intended for tea practice, but you reimagine them as tea objects and start using them in, using them in the tea room. So a classic example is like Korean noodle bowls that they imported for Korea for like 50 cents and then reappropriated them uh, in China Yu as objects that evoked the philosophy of Wabi or the ideas of the Wabi aesthetic in an object and then reached extraordinarily high prices because they crystallise an image or an idea that was extremely valuable to these people. Uh, and stuff like that branding an object with a decision that this is a tea bowl is like what Marcel Duchamp was doing with his ready-mades. Like, this bottle rack is not a bottle rack. This is a sculpture. That's my decision. I'm signing it. Here it is. What do you reckon? So uh, these, these acts in the art world is what Virgil Abloh would say is leaving a canon in the, in the, in the tradition. And for Virgil Abloh, establishing a canon in the fashion world, the contemporary art world, or the tea world, whatever world you're involved in, was very central to his thinking. One of the quotes that Virgil Abloh says in, in response to the question, continuing on from talking about Margiela and how Margiela established a canon, is that Margiela didn't come to the fashion world with a style, he came with a logic. After talking about history and after talking about establishing canons, he gets on to the point of what he really thinks the future of fashion is going to be. Well, this is an extremely hard question to answer when you're so involved in that world, to get outside the world and try and see it from afar as to where it could be going. But what he, he gave as his response is something that really reflects how Chana Yu has taken shape traditionally as an art form. And what 
Virgil Abloh says is that fashion is going to go in the direction of linking cultures. So a runway or a release of a new collection has show notes and has the philosophy behind about all the influences that are going into the new garments and how they're designed and how they're presented. And he sees this becoming more and more multicultural, linking different cultural influences from around the world into uh, unified presentations of the new. And what T has done since its inception, really, as Chana Yu, is draw upon disparate cultures, i.e. all the cultures in Asia or around Japan, so the Korean Peninsula, the Chinese culture, also Thai, Vietnamese culture, Polynesian culture, and also European culture, which was coming into Japan at the inception of Chana Yu, and mixing these together to make a harmonised presentation in the tea room. So drawing disparate elements together under a harmonised theme to present something to the guests so that people may be able to enjoy a singular experience in the tea room. And this is very close to what Virgil Abloh is presenting as the future of fashion. The other thing that Virgil Abloh talked about when he was unpacking his vision for the future of fashion was that more and more people from different ethnic backgrounds would have more and more of an influence on the fashion world and the direction it was taking. So his case is a great example. Uh, his background is from Ghana. He grew up in Chicago, um, but his family background is from Ghana. And here he is at the end of his life at the head of the men's collection at Louis Vuitton. So that's pretty incredible. And of course, um, by being a fashion historian, he had a very deep knowledge of what was going on, the history of, of the Maison and everything. And then bringing his own unique angle as growing up from an immigrant family in America, and then bringing that into the direction of Louis Vuitton, one of the most powerful fashion houses in the world at the moment. So that's intensely interesting for the Japanese tea ceremony. Because we have lots of people that are now in all different cultures around the world that have spent a lot of time learning and mastering the art of the Japanese tea ceremony or Chanu Yu. And now their own unique cultural perspectives are starting to come through their practice and starting to be expressed through their practice, which is kind of unavoidable, I think. Um, the way that the Japanese tea world operates is it tries to constrict things pretty close to tradition, but the pressure is becoming greater and greater and greater with more and more foreign practitioners. And now we have uh, a social problem in Japan where there's an ageing society and not enough young people coming through to uphold and continue these noble traditions. So it's kind of inevitable that more and more people from outside Japan are going to have to uphold Japanese traditions. Um, so it's very important that I think uh, tea schools in Japan become more and more comfortable with the idea that people that are non-Japanese uh, are able to get very, very deep into Chanayu with a great reverence and respect of where it's coming from and start to present it in ways that are more immediately appealing to people from different cultures. And for both the fashion world and for both the tea world, uh, I can only see this as a fantastic progression and a very promising trajectory and gives me, for one, great hope for the future of where my art is going. To draw things to a close, one of the things that Virgil said in finishing his response to this question of what the future of fashion is, is that people from different descents can start to be something like their own Margiela. So people from dis disparate cultures or people from or, or global citizens can start to leave their mark on the fashion world that other people can start to iterate off or people can bounce off their ideas to evolve the canons and evolve the ideas existing in the fashion world slash tea world to make it flower and grow into something that takes the principles, 
especially in the case of Chanyu, that takes the principles like wabi, um, searching for stillness, searching for harmony between people, breaking down borders. Uh, these things will, has to be an integral part of Chanyu, but it doesn't necessarily need to stay the same look as it did 400 years ago in the wabi tea room with the same wabi utensils. They can be a wabi tea room in southern France with wabi tea utensils from country Victoria in Australia, um, things like this. And also the shape that it's practiced doesn't necessarily need to continue the four hours of the set protocol flowing from arranging the charcoal and then enjoying some incense and then enjoying a light meal, then having a short break and having thick tea and then thin tea and then going home, taking off your kimono exhausted. It can be rearranged and remixed to maybe be two hours involve some of those elements, maybe cut out the meal and have incense and koicha and then get the guests to arrange some flowers and then do thin tea while having light conversation or even gong fucha at the end can take on these sorts of arrangements and forms and be emancipated from some of the rigid cultural structures. So that's the tea for today. Thank you very much Virgil Abloh for your timeless inspiration and wonderful drive as a human being and pushing culture into new areas. And thank you very much to Sen Rikyu for the Oribe, the Grand Master of my tea school, Ueda Soke, and other people that have had a lasting influence on the practice of Chana Yu and the way that I practice Chana Yu. And so here's to exploring more of these new ideas through this Funk Wabi podcast. Thanks for listening.